So I would like to now introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Alex Koiter. He is an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environment at Brandon University. His research program focuses on land and water management practices and its implication for soil and water quality. His research group investigates a wide range of agricultural issues, including soil erosion, downstream sedimentation, nutrient dynamics, greenhouse gas fluxes, and extremes of moisture. Riparian zones, permanently vegetated areas next to streams and wetlands, are a relatively common site across the prairies. Despite covering a small proportion of the total landscape, these areas are generally more diverse and more productive than adjacent farmland and serve to connect land and water bodies the, the, through the flow of the water and nutrients. This session is going to focus on how the unique climate and hydrology of the prairies affects how we see, use, and manage riparian areas for production, conservation of habitat, mitigation extreme moisture events, and reducing nutrient and sediment pollution. Please help me welcome Alex Porter. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, so today, yes, I'm going to be talking about um, riparian areas. And so I'm going to take you a little bit on my kind of learning journey as I've kind of explored and come to know uh, what riparian is, isn't, what it can and cannot do. So we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of functions do they have and we'll, and we'll kind of focus in on how we can use them or how we like to think we use them to improve uh, water quality. So we are all here because we're interested in land and water. And so I want to start off by uh, acknowledging that Brand and our southern area are the traditional homeland of Anishinaabe, Oji Cree, and Dene, and really want to kind of focus on is that well when we often shed we often think about it as kind of well land and water but again we also need to kind of remember and recognize that you know people are also part of that of, of watersheds right and so I think we need to appreciate the the history of that relationship but also kind of what does the future hold for their for that relationship as well so I, I thought I, I'm going to keep walking away from the mic, my apologies. Uh, so I thought I'd start off by talking just a little bit about myself um, and kind of introduce myself. I don't know many people here, um, but as I, I was, um, was mentioned earlier, so I'm at Brandon University in the Department of Geography and Environment. And um, I've lived in many different places uh, across Canada. Uh, so I've seen and been in many different types of watersheds, from everything from high alpine ones in BC to um, riparian, or, um, watersheds in the Maritimes, and now I'm finding myself here in, in the prairies. The only place I really haven't been is, I haven't seen much of the northern, nor the northern parts of Canada, which is the bulk of Canada. So I, uh, watershed is inherently uh, interdisciplinary, and so when I have an interest in water, uh, watershed science. I'm really interested in looking at things like soil and water quality, but also hydrology. Uh, we need to talk about the land uses, so that may include agriculture, but also others. And I'm also interested in looking at the geomorphology, so basically looking at, well, what does the topography look like? What is the superficial geology? And what does that all mean uh, for, for a watershed? So before I kind of launch into it, um, science, you know, it's a very collaborative uh, process. So I want to kind of say thank you to my collaborators and the research groups and also their collaborators, right, the big network. And in particular, I want to highlight three individuals. First is David Law from the University of Manitoba, Bill Owens from University of Northern British Columbia, and Marin McRae from University of Waterloo. I also want to highlight that a lot of the work I'm going to show you here today Right, has been funded and supported by a, quite a wide range of, of groups. Everything from the, from the federal government um, to the provincial government uh, to conservation groups like the Deerwood and Soil, Soil and Water Management Association. Uh, it's also been supported by industry, so uh, places like Manitoba Beef and Forage Initiatives, 
but also the support of producers as well and the people who kind of live and, and use the land as well. They've been awesome, awesome collaborators. And I just want to make sure that we recognize them and their contributions. So we'll start off with an easy one, or maybe it's an easy one, I'm not certain. And that's asking the question, well, what on earth is a riparian area? So when I was making this presentation, right, just like most people in the room, the first thing I did is I typed it into Google, right? Because that's what we all do. If we're not certain about something or we want to see what people are saying, right, we use Google. And a whole bunch of different uh, sources came up. And I've just kind of selected a couple, a couple of my favorites. So the one I typically use is, is the top one. And this has this idea of a transition zone. Right? It's what separates the, the land, the soil, from the aquatic or, or, the, or the water. Right? And it's kind of that, that in-between zone. Uh, one of my favorite ones that I, I kind of discovered while, while making this presentation was the wetter than dry, the drier than wet. Right? And then the last one, right, it looks at vegetation. So what kinds of vegetation do we see growing along the edge? In this case, they say a natural body of water. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some examples, and I want you to kind of keep these, these kind of definitions in the back of your mind. We also see these, these types of figures quite regularly, right? They kind of show the interactions between surface water, groundwater. They show nutrient cycling, gas fluxes, right? They kind of, right, we've probably all seen this in some shape or form. The other kind of confusing thing is riparian areas they go by many names. So you may come across, people call them vegetative buffer strips, call them filter strips, buffers, corridors, or you might say grass buffer or riparian forest. And in this presentation, we can think of them all to be the same. But one of the things, I, when I think about this, why it has so many names, is, is I think it has to do with, well, who is naming them? Are you a producer? Are you an ecologist? Are you a hydrologist? Kind of how do you perceive these, these areas, right? And you kind of name them um, based on, on how you appreciate them. So what does a riparian look like? And so I'm going to walk through a couple of examples. And so this is a, an example from the South Tobacco Creek, which is located in South Central Manitoba. And it's actually a small retention pond. And again, we can see that the road is, 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 dam, is the, the dam in this situation. And we can kind of see both from the photograph and from the uh, Google Earth image, right? It's surrounded by these nice trees. And so again, this kind of fits pretty well with those definitions other than, well, is it a natural body of water? Yeah, I mean, kind of. I mean, the, the river was there, right? We just kind of dammed it up, right? Which kind of changed the landscape. But here's another example. Uh, so this is uh, uh, from the Manitoba Forage Initiatives Farm, just about 20 more minutes north of town. And here what we see is a whole bunch of grasses, knee-high grasses surrounding a prairie pothole or, or a wetland. But again, it looks very, very different though, doesn't it? So again, this is a naturally occurring body of water. And, but now, instead of trees, we actually have grasses. But again, it's still a riparian area. This also comes from the South Tobacco Creek watershed. So this is just near the town of Miami. And so again, here I'm actually standing in, in the South Tobacco Creek. And I look downstream and I can see all these lovely trees. When I look at the Google Earth image to the right, right, we can see that kind of nice linear strip of trees. Um, yeah, there, there was no water there. So, Still a riparian area? And I'm not certain it's actually wetter than dry at this point in time, right? I would almost say it's about as dry as everything else around it. So again, this, this idea of, you know, being a transition from kind of soil or upland to, to the aquatic environment, right, it changes throughout the year, right? And, but again, I would still consider this to be a riparian area. Right, so those are some, uh, I guess I would say maybe more easy examples. Here's another example I want you guys to consider. So here we have basically a, a large puddle. Right? It's this, this low-lying area in this pasture field. Right? It, has, it has water, 
it's naturally occurring. So does this have a riparian area? Right, it doesn't have that nice ring of vegetation around it. But again, it's still, there's still a transition, right? Still transitions from this terrestrial environment into this, well, aquatic environment. But again, it looks very, very different. But again, I still think we can apply some of these same principles of riparian areas to, to a situation like this. Now, again, one year we may have standing water, and other years we might not. Or maybe we only may have water in the spring, maybe not in the fall. But again, I want you just to kind of think about these riparian areas in a bit of a different way and start to see them in a whole bunch of different places. So here's another tough one. Well, here we have a ditch. So when I first moved to Manitoba, right, there is ditches everywhere, right? You think about every section of land, every mile by a mile, ditches pretty much on all four sides, right? And these ditches then flow into, into municipal drains, flow into provincial drains, which then they flow into rivers or lakes or what have you, right? So from a, like a, the, the number of, of, of meters or kilometers or miles, right? Ditches are probably the one of the most prevalent in, in, our, in our prairie landscape. So I, then I asked the question, does, does, a, does a ditch have a riparian zone? Again, if we think of it as a, as a, as a body of water, we, I think we'd have to say yes, right? But it looks, it looks very, very different. But again, we still have that transition from you know, the terrestrial environment into the aquatic environment. And again, some of the same themes kind of come up, right? It doesn't necessarily have water in it year round, or it may, not, it may have water some years, but not others. But again, what I want us to kind of think about is, well, yeah, maybe these are riparian areas, and maybe they are worth paying attention to. Okay, so the next problem. So now we kind of looked at them, we saw some, some easy examples, we saw some difficult examples, right? They come in a, in, a lar in a wide range of shapes and sizes, and they look very different. So the next kind of challenge is, okay, where does, or perhaps maybe the better question is, where should a riparian area start and end? So this figure I, I grabbed from a publication, right, it's just kind of highlighting some very different um, ways of defining a riparian area and kind of what that means in terms of how they look. So we could use things like historical observations, right? There was a, a speaker earlier, you know, their family had been on that farm for almost 100 years. So there we have, you know, at least 100 years of visual observation. I suspect that family, those producers, have a pretty good idea of maybe where the riparian area starts and stops. Right? There is a lot of power in visual observations. Right? Don't ever discount them. We could also think about them as maybe a bit more operational. Well, are they too steep or too wet to farm? Right? So that might be our defining feature. Right? And that we've been kind of focusing maybe on the terrestrial side. Well, on the other side, towards the aquatic side, right? Again, we've kind of talked a little bit about the, the fluctuating water table. So that end comes up, goes down on an annual basis, in between years, right? It's constantly changing. Fence lines is another common one I see in the landscape, right? So again, you may not have put that fence in place, but you may continue to use it. And that just might be where your riparian area starts. Right, we could take a, perhaps a bit more of an ecological perspective, and we can look at the vegetation. Right, because one of the defining features we saw earlier in those definitions was water-loving vegetation. So again, we can start to observe and count and identify plants, right? That might help us kind of define, well, where should the edge be? We can take a bit more of a hydrological approach, right? So again, this idea of, well, at what point are we no longer, you know, wetter, wetter than drier? But again, that can be a little bit more difficult. So again, we have variation within a year, between years, between decades. So again, perhaps when you put in your riparian area, it may seem like a good idea at the time or a good start and stop place. But in a wet year, you're like, oh, I should have actually backed it up a little bit. 
right? We could also look at ecosystem functions, right? So what kind of functions is happening? What kind of, what kind of nutrient cycling do we see? What type of habitat do we see? Right, so those types of questions may also help us define a riparian area. And then the last one is just regulatory, right? So there may be rules in place that say, well, a stream of a certain width needs so many meters of, of a buffer area or a riparian area, right? So maybe that's how you define it. And kind of the whole point of this is I think different people will define start and stop of a riparian area differently. And it's not to say that one is wrong and the other one is right. I just think that these riparian areas, right, they basically grade from terrestrial into the aquatic. There's no real hard start and stop to these things. And so again, just trying to give some thought to this, I think is, is really important, especially from a, a management perspective. Okay, so let's start talking about, well, what does a riparian area do? And so I've got a number of them. So the first is they serve as an important area for recreation, right? So I talked about people living in the watersheds, right, and, and playing in the watersheds. So here's a great example. So here's a photo my colleague took of their family canoeing down the river. We see some people fishing from the shoreline, right? It looks like a really nice place to go for a canoe ride. And here in Southern Manitoba, right again, if you look at some Google imagery, where do we start to see these wild areas? Right, they're almost always, not always, but often they're the riparian areas. Right, so if, again, if you want a bit more of a wilderness or wild experience, right, we tend to gravitate these, to these types of areas, right, because they're beautiful. They're also habitat, right? And so again, if we look at this, you know, Google image of the, you know, typical prairie landscape, right, we can see that these, these areas, they account for a relatively small proportion, right? So anywhere, you know, in around 5% often. And, but is these areas, right, they're biodiversity hosts, right? This is typically where we see really unique plants and where we tend to see a lot more animals and insects. Right, the photo on the right here, right, showing a clutch of um, duck eggs. And I nearly stepped on them because this is more one of my field sites. So again, there's just, there's wildlife everywhere. The other really important thing to consider, again, if we look at even these Google images, we see a lot of straight lines. We see a lot of roads and things like that. Right, and they can, they can be barriers to animal movement. Right, so a lot of animals actually use these corridors to get from place A to place B, right? Because it's the only kind of continuous little bit of wild, wild land we have, right? So they're very, very critical for that. They also serve a function in terms of what does that stream look like, right? You saw that photo when I was standing in the creek. You could see the tree roots in the banks. Right, they provide a lot of stabilization and stabilization. So I was involved in this project where they were actually looking at channel characteristics under different uh, forms of vegetation. So they were looking at predominantly treed areas and predominantly grassy areas. And what they found was that, well, depending on what type of vegetation you had, the stream looked a little bit different. Right, it may be a little bit wider, a little bit narrower, a bit deeper, right? It may be a little bit more straight, right? Uh, we also think of, you know, the trees, right? A lot of those trees fall in, into, the, into, the, into the water courses, right? That idea of large woody debris, which creates in-stream habitat, right? So even as we start to manage these riparian areas, right, we need to give some thought to, well, what types of species are we interested in having? And what will that do to what that river, or even that wetland, what will that do to what it looks like? The other really important uh, function is that riparian areas are part of farms, right? So in most cases, you know, again, we're talking about Southern Manitoba here, right? Riparian areas are about five to 10% of the total land area, right? So not an insignificant amount. 
Now, the, the Google image I have here, right, again, just north of town here, we're really into the Prairie Paul region. Now here, riparian areas can be as much as 25% of the total land area of, of a farm. Right, so they represent a, a big part of a working farm. And in many cases, right, they're, they're also utilized. So here we have an example of, of grazing a riparian area. So they're taking advantage of the abundant forages that typically grow in these nice wet areas. And I was talking to a uh, cow producer um, yesterday, and I was asking, I was telling him about this presentation, and, and I asked him, like, you know, what are your thoughts on, on cattle and, and riparian areas? And he had two pieces of, uh, two things he kind of wanted to share. First, he's like, he loves fences, right, to basically control access. So when should the cattle go in and, and basically kind of protect it um, that way? He wasn't saying don't use it. He was very stressing, well, we need to use it at appropriate times. And again, if we think about last summer, right, which it wasn't that long ago, right, it was very dry here. People were scrambling to find feed, right? So of course, where do they turn? Well, to the areas that are wetter than dry, right? That was the one place that was still producing abundant forage. The other um, um, piece of information this producer had was that he was he was concerned about the um, kind of increase in, in in annual cropping and putting pastures out of pasture land and putting them into annual crops. And one thing he was saying was that it was pushing some of the, the grazing into these riparian areas. And so again, they were becoming even more important because we were losing other pasture and hayland as a result. The last thing, last function I want to talk about, and we're gonna, this is where it's gonna, we're gonna kind of focus on, is we're very interested in what it does to surface water. Right, we call them filters, we call them buffers, right? Because that's, that's what we want them to do, and that's in fact what they typically do do. And so they're often used as part of a watershed management plan, right? If we want to improve water quality, right? Riparian areas, let's filter out those uh, nutrients, let's filter out those contaminants, let's filter out those pathogens. The other thing it can do is it can um, reduce the severity of flooding. Right, because one of the riparian um, attributes is they tend to have good infiltration. Right, so the idea is, well, let's infiltrate the water, right, because whatever, whatever doesn't infiltrate must run off. Right, so again, it can be a key part of mitigating um, flood damage. Right, and this, I think riparian areas are often touted and cited as, as a great thing to do. And we'll talk a little bit about why they might not be as awesome as we think they are. They're, they are awesome, don't get me wrong. Right, but I think with water quality declines across the province, right, and Lake Winnipeg kind of being the poster child for that, right, there's a lot of public interest, pressure, and maybe even outrage for improving this water quality. And so one of the tools in our water, watershed management toolbox is repairing areas. And so they definitely can be and I want to stress part of the solution. Right? They're not necessarily the solution, but part of the solution. So let's start off with some kind of nicely controlled experiments, right? As scientists, I love these types of, of, of work, right? We control basically the weather, we can control everything, and we can ask very specific questions. So here on the right hand side is kind of a somewhat of a typical kind of experiment, right? They basically sectioned off a piece of the riparian area and they're adding water and they're adding sediment of known volumes and concentrations and they're basically seeing what's coming out the other end. So a few things to kind of note about these types of experiments. So they typically have uniform flow of water. So basically there's no concentration. They're often in many cases newly established. And that many times they're done um, during warm temperatures or in warm climates. Like I even ask myself, when do I do most of my field research? Now? No, not really. I'm usually out right in the spring and, and mostly in the summer when it's a bit easier to do things. Right? It's challenging working in the winter. The other thing is a lot of the research comes from 
other parts of the globe, right? And specifically, we get a lot of information from the more southern states, right? The very different climate there. And the last thing is, is a lot of times these are looking at uh, rainfall events. And so I don't want to give the impression that these types of, this type of work is not important. They are very important. They allow us to answer very particular questions and they allow us to understand how things work, right? By controlling everything, we can ask and understand these systems quite a bit better. But one of the things we need to be a bit careful about is, well, how well does this information transfer to the prairie landscape, right? Going from the small experimental unit to some of these watersheds. And that's kind of where I kind of want to lead uh, the rest of this uh, discussion. So one of the things we talked about was uniform flow of water. So this here is a, is a section in the South Tobacco Creek. So again, South Central Manitoba. And we can see from the satellite imagery, there's lots of nice repairing areas. And we can, you know, just by looking where the trees are, we actually know where the streams are. So I look at this and say, wow, there must be some great riparian areas, lots of filtering, lots of buffering going on. So some of my colleagues, they said, okay, well, let's actually look to find out where water is actually moving. Right, so we were able to extract the drainage network using some, um, like a digital elevation model. And a few surprising things, right? We have all these kilometers and perhaps miles of riparian areas and most of the water is going through about 1% to 2% of that total length. And the reason why we have that is because the landscape is not flat, right? So water moves together. For even those who come from the Red River Valley, it is not flat, right? Drive around, you see water ponding and pooling and running off at particular places. So it's not, not unique to this area, right? Across, across the prairies. And so one of the take-home messages from this is that most of the riparian areas aren't actually filtering runoff, okay? And so this maybe suggests that, well, maybe what we need to do is, well, where we have water moving through these areas, maybe they need to be extra wide and extra awesome, right, to actually get some, some extra filtering. So let's take a look at the climate and this idea of rainfall events. So here is... Um, uh, the x-axis here, the bottom, right, is looking at a few different uh, hydrometric stations that are run by uh, Water Survey of Canada. And again, this is in the Tobacco Creek, so, um, so central Manitoba. And we're looking at cumulative discharge over the course of a year. And so what, what I want to kind of demonstrate here is, you know, 60 to 80 percent of our total runoff for, for any given year typically happens in April and May two months out of the entire year, that's getting the bulk of that runoff, right? So most of the time, our riparian areas aren't actually filtering. And that's fine, right? They, they provide tons and lots of other really important uh, functions. But again, from a water quality perspective, right, we need to kind of give this some, some consideration. We can also look at year-to-year -year variability. Okay, so here is a figure looking at uh, three hydrometric stations in the same watershed over a six-year period. Now, what we see from here is that two of those six years account for about 75% of the total runoff, right? So that means in some years, right, riparian areas are super, super critical, right? Because that's when the bulk of the material is coming from, right? In the other years, Right? They're, they're a little less important because we have less material moving through them. So let's look, have a look at a typical prairie riparian area during the spring snowmelt. Okay? So again, here's some uh, photos my, my colleague took. So I want to ask yourself, how well do you think that riparian area is filtering that runoff? Right, we have frozen soils, so our, our infiltration is probably pretty minimal. Right, and we can ask ourselves, well, how much nutrients are, is this vegetation taking up? Probably none, right, they're still in winter dormancy. Right, so we see that the filtering capacity of these riparian areas isn't at its best 
when we, when we need it the most. Okay? Again, just something to kind of bear in mind. So, here's another study, and this figure here, the black line, so let me back up. So the, the bottom axis is distance, and we can see those two red vertical lines. So the solid red line, that is the current fence line of that field. The dashed line is an old fence line, right? So they've actually moved the fence um, a little bit. And to the right, that's into the riparian area. To the left, right, that's into the field. And so the black line is actually looking at uh, cesium-137, which is a, a fallout rating nuclide. And we use it to look at, well, where, where in the landscape is soil accumulating? Okay, so that's what, is, that's what we use it for. Right, so higher amounts of cesium is typically associated with high rates of soil deposition. And the blue line here is, is the elevation, okay? And so I want to draw your attention to what's happening at that fence line. Right, so the, the cesium is showing a lot of deposition, and the topography, we're actually seeing this little step, right, this little kind of bump. And so that's actually creating, uh, doing something kind of interesting. Water is actually starting to pond behind it. And again, we've probably seen a lot of times, right, at the edge of the field, you see a bunch of water ponding. And we ask ourselves, why isn't it moving into the stream? Well, it's a lot of cases, Right, tillage has just thrown a little bit of soil along the fence line, and it's kind of preventing that. Right, and that actually may not even be a bad thing. Right, what happens when water ponds? Sediment falls out of suspension, right? It could be a good thing. This figure here is the same field site, but now we're looking at three different metrics of phosphorus. And so what I wanted to show you, or kind of demonstrate with this, is look at where the phosphorus is accumulating. It's accumulating kind of right at that field boundary and into the riparian area, right? And this is kind of what we would expect, right? Because riparian areas are supposed to be good filters. Yeah, it's, it's filtering, definitely. But we're actually starting to see an accumulation, in this case, in phosphorus. And what we need to consider is that these riparian area soils, right, they do have a finite capacity to store material, okay? Right, so it's, a, its effectiveness as a filter tends to decline over time, right? Especially when we start to talk about uh, things like phosphorus. Another study done by my colleagues, in this example here, they set up some weirs, and they set it on the kind of the field edge and the water edge. And what they are interested in is looking at, well, what is the nutrient concentration of water moving into the riparian area? And what is the concentration of phosphorus leaving the riparian area? Right, so again, this idea that, well, riparian areas, right, there should be filters, right? It should be less as it starts to move through. Well, one of the interesting findings was that, yeah, sometimes it acts as a filter, and that's up those positive numbers. But in actually, in many cases, we actually saw a slight enrichment in phosphorus concentration in that water leaving the riparian zone. So as that water moved through the riparian zone, it was actually picking up nutrients. Right? So what we're seeing here is that riparian area, in some cases and sometimes, is actually contributing nutrients. Right? And that's coming both from the soil as well as, a, as a vegetation. But again, what we need to think about this is that in, in, sometimes it, it is doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? It, it is filtering. And I suspect a lot of these um, enrichments are typically happening during that spring snow melt, right? When that filtering capacity is, is kind of next to nothing, right? There's still lots of vegetation around, perhaps contributing phosphorus. So some work uh, being done um, by my colleague Marin and uh, her student Ike uh, Noise, right? They were also interested in looking at well, what happens to vegetation as it undergoes these freeze and thaw cycles that we see in the fall and in the spring. So this figure here is showing a few different sites. Some sites here in Manitoba, which is the bottom two, and some sites in Ontario, the top two. 
And what we're seeing here is we, we, we collected some, some vegetation in the fall just before the first uh, frost. And we basically subjected them to some experimental freezing. For the light purple boxes here, that's a, a moderate freeze. And the darker blue is a more severe freeze, which is lower temperatures. And so what we see least by this vegetation increases with the severity of, of freezing. Project, we also started to separate out the different types of vegetation in these riparian areas. And one of the things that they saw, so again on the bottom is we have uh, kind of three main species that they found, and then the Y or the vertical axis is the amount of uh, phosphorus being released into the environment. And we see that different types of vegetation release different amounts of phosphorus. So again, we may be able to take some of this information and use it in terms of kind of managing um, nutrients. Now, the other really interesting thing um, that the student do, did is we actually placed some, some uh, temperature probes at the surface. We didn't bury them, they were, they were sitting just on top of the surface underneath the grasses, grassy vegetation. And we basically wanted to ask the question, well, well, how old is it getting? And despite, you know, Manitoba winters, right, being minus 35, minus 40, we only saw a temperature of about at the lowest. Right, the snow is actually a quite, a, quite a good insulator. And so this information is showing us that some of the experiments that people have done looking at free spa aren't necessarily using the appropriate temperatures. Right, because they're, they're, they're freezing them at minus 40 or, or something like that, but we just don't typically see that. The other really, really kind of cool thing about this data, it kind of shows us, well, how many freeze thaw cycles does the surface under right, in a typical year? Right, it stays below. And then in this case, in the spring, right, we tend to see a lot more, we tend to see a lot more fluctuation, right? I guess the only issue with this is we actually missed the, uh, the fall, which probably would also uh, be quite fluctuating temperature. Now, the other thing that we see a lot uh, in the prairies is, is flooding. And so this example here is they're basically, they, they took a couple of soils, right? They added some different fertilizers, in this case, some, uh, some swine fertilization, uh, for, uh, manure, pardon me, right? And they basically flooded those soils. And what we see here is that over time, the amount of phosphorus increases. So what we're seeing here is that flooding soils can actually release phosphorus. And a lot of this is, is thought to be due to the fact that these soils are going anaerobic, right? There's just no oxygen left, right? And as, that, uh, that, as we start to get the anaerobic uh, and re, uh, reducing conditions, Right, certain phosphorus bearing minerals, right, they start to actually dissolve a bit easier. And I suspect that's what leading to that flush of, of nutrients. Now, while this is a field experiment, I think I suspect that our riparian areas being quite wet and often flooded, where right, again we you might want to ask ourselves, well, what's happening during those flooding events in terms of the release of phosphorus from these riparian areas? One thing I want people to remember here is that riparian areas, they should be the last line of defense, right, in terms of managing surface runoff and water quality, right? We kind of show that as a filtering mechanism, they're not necessarily as awesome as we'd kind of hope they would be. So maybe we need to start to look up slope a little bit, and up, right, up in the, uh, in the field and ask ourselves, well, are there things we can be doing better there? And we, I've heard a couple of talks here, they've talked about, you know, improving soil health and crop health, right? That's going to be where we're going to see a lot of gains. But it's usually not that, not that simple. So in this example here, we have this paired watershed. So we're same climate, same soils, but they're managed differently. So one is a kind of a conventional till, and the other one is a conservation till. And we basically, they, they looked at, well, what was the quality of water leaving this, these paired watersheds. And something interesting kind of came, up, came about. Conservation till, which is 
often touted as pretty, being pretty awesome, right? It reduced soil erosion and, you know, but one of the uh, things that actually happened was that the, the dissolved phosphorus actually started to creep up a little bit. Now, from a water quality perspective, that's not awesome, okay? And one of the thoughts behind this is that through, when we have conservation till, is we're basically stratifying nutrients, right? So without the, the continual mixing of the soil, right, the phosphorus and nutrients are staying a bit closer to the surface. When we do have these runoff events, right, they're being picked up and moved across. We're seeing less erosion, but perhaps a little bit uh, greater uh, dissolved nutrient losses. Right, so the answer is not easy. So a few other things to consider. Well, maybe we need to kind of look in the riparian area. Right, I talked about how they are part of a farm. Well, and we showed that they can accumulate nutrients. Right, we know that they're not, there can be um, a good source of forage and, and good high productivity during drought years. So maybe we need to start harvesting this vegetation and actually have a mechanism to remove that phosphorus from that area. So that terrain can be challenging, right? So if you're trying to mow or bale, right, it might be too wet, it might be too steep to do. Now the other thing I want to think, uh, for us to think about is that riparian areas are more than just filters, right? So I know I've been talking a lot about water quality and how these riparian areas may be not the best filters, but there are, there are lots of good reasons and lots of important reasons for us to have them there, right? Not just about water quality. So I have a project now looking at cattle grazing in riparian areas. And so this particular project, what we're doing is we're bringing cattle in in the fall, when things tend to be a little bit drier, and most birds aren't nesting, so it's not quite as, as critical a period for, for the, the animals that utilize that habitat. And so we're going in there and, and we're grazing them, right? So it's hopefully we're going to limit our, our disturbance or going in the fall. It also extends the grazing season, so before switching over to other sources of feed. And maybe this idea of like, well, let's remove that vegetation prior to winter. Now you're probably asking, or you're probably thinking to yourself, well, yeah, in this case, nutrients are coming and going in one end, but right there's a lot going out the other end as well. And so one of the things we're really interested in looking at as part of this project is actually looking at the distribution of phosphorus, both as a function of a distance from the kind of the edge of the wetland, but also kind of looking at the vertical distribution. Right, so we're looking at the amount of phosphorus in the standing biomass, but also the litter. In, in this particular area, right, there's quite a layer, a layer of thatch. We're looking at uh, an organic horizon, because we're close to the wetland, and we're also looking in the top bit of the mi mineral horizon, or the A horizon. Right, so we're kind of interested to see, well, what's happened to the phosphorus pool, at least in the vertical, as well as the horizontal direction, right? And so we have a control, we have two uh, levels of grazing, and then we have kind of a mode no treatment that we can carry. So this photo here, so my one hand, all right, I have all the standing no mass, and the other, I have the thatch from that same area. So you can just see the amount of bottom sitting there as a potential source of, of phosphorus. The figure here, right, the bottom is again looking at the different treatments. Uh, the vertical axis is looking at the amount of phosphorus. And the uh, purple boxes, right, that's kind of before the treatment, before the grazing, before the mowing, and the green boxes are after. And so what we're seeing, at least looking at the biomass, right, we actually see a reduction in the amount of phosphorus available to be lost. Now it'll be interesting to see what's happening to the litter, litter and the uh, soil surface areas, right, because that's what's getting all the, the urine and the feces and things like that. So that would be the other part of the puzzle. Okay, so we're wrapping up here. So what's next? Right, again, this idea that, you know, if we're going to look at water quality and quantity, right, riparian areas are the last line of defense. We really need to be looking up, up slope and up watershed, right? And we need to apply those, you know, concepts of healthy soils and healthy crops, right? We need practices that are efficient at using water and nutrients. So anything that you apply goes into your crop, right? There was a speaker earlier who says, well, they're paying for all this, they don't want to lose it, well, for a variety of reasons, right? 
But again, that is easier said than done. Right? You try to manage for one particular problem, right? You may have some unintended consequences. Right? So that idea of looking at conservation and conventional tillage, right? Yeah, you, you stop soil erosion, but you kind of increase the dissolved phosphorus. Right? There's a trade-off. We also need to extend the concepts of uh, soil, healthy soils and healthy crops into the riparian areas, right? So maybe we need healthy riparian areas, right? And again, this, this idea that the farm does not, <coughs> pardon me, does not end at the, at the fence line, right? And we need to balance all the other riparian functions that we talked about along with production. So this is what my plot looked like after grazing. Right, so on the one side we have, you can see we grazed, and the other side is the control. Right, and it starts to raise questions about, well, how good of a habitat did we, did we create by, by, by grazing? Right, and so again, that's another aspect that I, I really kind of want to get into, is to actually look at some of these other functionalities with riparian management. So not just looking at nutrients, not just looking at, at production, but all, some of those other attributes as well. We also need homegrown uh, cold climate research to support good decision making. So this is a review paper that was put out by a colleague of mine. And the colored map is showing all the different climate classifications. And what she did is she kind of highlighted where some of the studies are coming from, um, at least the some, somewhat similar uh, climates. There's also some going on in, in Europe and other places. But again, North America has its own kind of unique uh, agricultural production system. So again, it's something to consider. We also need to appreciate that right, we are a snow melt driven hydrology here, right? And that creates a lot of challenges, right? When we need those riparian areas the most, it's often when they're, they're not able to do, perform the best, right? This is where we start to need to explore some other options. And I've heard, and listening to other people, I've heard of other things that people are doing to improve water quality. In this example here, right, the little black diamonds are showing um, some small retention ponds. So again, they were pretty successful at reducing flooding, and they were reasonably successful at retaining nutrients. And again, unfortunately, phosphorus wasn't as awesome as, as it could have been. This is some work um, being done at near the Morden uh, Research Center. And so here they're again, they're, what they're doing here is pairing riparian areas to a retention pond. And so they're getting the, the water to move through a riparian area first to the retention pond. And again, they've seen mixed uh, success here. So again, good for reducing peak flows, but again, that pesky phosphorus, again, they're not awesome at it. The other thing we need to consider, right, as the climate changes, we're seeing more, uh, more frequent severe weather, and we could also consider this as well, but also flooding, right? And we need to ask ourselves, well, are the riparian areas that we have and manage, are, are they designed to kind of meet this, right? So again, when we think of a big flood, this is probably when we need the riparian areas the most. So are they up to the challenge? Or is there more we could be doing? Is there better things we could be doing? Come up with solutions, right? Again, if we want to stick to the riparian area, right, it's gonna actually take a team. So this example here, I chose it because it has the best name ever. It's called the spaghetti and meatballs. So the spaghetti is the linear features along the streams, and the meatballs are the little patches. Now this design was, was uh, designed with amphibians in mind, right? They were interested in looking at, well, what is the best riparian design for frogs in the Pacific Northwest, right? And this is what they kind of came up with. But what I think we really need to do, and we, I think we are doing this, and this is one of the awesome things about a conference like this, is that we're gonna get hopefully everyone in the room to talk about this, right? And to figure out, well, what are the priorities? Can we design and can we manage in such a way where we can meet all those great functions, right? I don't want to just focus on water quality and forget about the other functions. 
right? I want to kind of point out here is I have the last bullet is the, is the economic. When I talk to producers and things like that, one of the first things they ask is like, well, what is the cost to production? Right? Something that's like, well, maybe we should just fence the riparian areas off. Yeah, fencing isn't cheap. Right? So we need to make sure that, they're, that, they're, that, they're, that they're, we understand, well, how much is this going to cost? So we're going to end with um, kind of maybe a plea from me. So as you see me walking around, and you've had a good success or know of a good success, success story, I want to know about it. If you had challenges, I also want to know about it, right? The reason I'm asking for this is I want to learn, right? I want to know what others are doing, right? A, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. And second, I also don't want to make the same mistakes. If you know something isn't working and it's not worth doing, I want to know. The other thing is, I also want to know, well, what are the questions, you know, someone like myself and other researchers, what, what should we be looking at? What's kind of the next best great thing, right? What direction should we be going? And then lastly, I want to meet you because I want, I want more collaborators, right? So if you're a watershed manager, or whether you're a producer, I don't care, I want to meet you, right? The more people I have in my phone book, the better. And with that, a few notes. If you scan the QR code, it'll take you to the presentation. Uh, so I posted it online. Um, all the links, every, all the green text with a, an underline, they're all clickable. and It'll bring you to the, to the research paper or to the research group website. I do apologize, some of those papers are behind paywalls. But again, it's just a, a good way to kind of recognize and learn about what other people have been doing. So with that, I would like to thank you guys very much for that. Thank you, Alex. That was really great. It's great to have a researcher here with applied scientists that are on the ground implementing. And Alex is asking you guys, what are your challenges? Where could he help? And where can we provide uh, test sites for him to research on? I think essentially. So, okay. Uh, so does anyone want to get started with a pressing question or comment that they'd like to make for Al to Alex right now? There's a lot of information there. so. I've got a lot going through my head. Don't make me ask the questions, though. I'm already doing the moderating. Okay, here we go. Thanks, Cliff. Looking at the frozen ground, I always thought that was a missing yellow sponges in the spring. You know, if you have four feet of snow, those riparian areas are absorbing uh, runoff. Yeah, and I think that's. So I didn't quite catch the last part of your, your comment. I think the riparian areas are still sponges. When, when they're frozen like that? Well, if, if there's four feet of snow and there's vegetation and biological activity, are they frozen? I think there is some capacity. So I don't think the filtering capacity really goes down to zero. It just can't handle what's kind of coming into it. So there is still infiltration going on during the spring snow melt. Right? And I think this is idea where there's such a large interest in this idea of, of soil health, kind of upslope is to basically promote good infiltration during the, during the spring snow melt, right, to capture that. So yes, there is um, some sponging uh, going on. It, it may depend on what kind of situation you're walking into during the fall. So if the soil is really saturated before freeze up, there's not a lot of pore space going on, right? They're, they're filled with frozen water. So its ability to act as a sponge is probably pretty low. And so you will see variation from year to year, depending on what the riparian area looks like prior to going into the, into the snowfall. Great, right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned Manitoba's extensive network. Yep. And so I, my hypothesis that at the moment, um, I would say that most of uh, Manitoba ditches are managed with a system of harvest, but no removal. So everything is cut down, mulched, and then left sitting in the bottom of the ditch, which must be the absolute ideal way to release nutrients. Yes, 
Yes, and so there has been some, some interest in looking at ditches as a source of phosphorus, because like you said, they tend to just accumulate anything and then think about what happens during that spring snow melt through all the freeze thaw events right it is it is a potential problem i also think about you know the, the sheer miles of ditches that area what an underutilized resource right now and i know in men in some places it is grazed and it is sometimes bailed and it is sometimes removed but i think there is room to do better I think that's, you know, must be an absolute minority because, yeah, where I live, we have mowers come through and they mow cattails and you get six to 12 inches of, of fluffy mattress left gone. And yeah, I think in those cases, the, the main mechanism is, is Removal is actually out through your ditches on the farmland in many cases, right? So that, there's your there's your other mechanism of removal is an excavator. <laughs> okay, I have one. So, so um, I noticed in one of your diagrams when you had the phosphorus levels that were climbing with the number of days that the water was being stored. Um, I think sometimes I, I've seen that the longer you hold the water, the more phosphorus is reduced. But I'm seeing from what your research is saying is that the more days that you're holding the water, the more phosphorus is being released from the soil. Uh, so excellent question. So that particular collaborator, um, again, I think that was an in-field in or in-lab experiment. And but you did see it did start to plateau and maybe you, and maybe there is opportunities or maybe there maybe it does actually reduce. And so maybe again, that might be a great research question of like, well, what happens if it's flooded for you know, a month or two? Maybe you do start to get other processes and other mechanisms of uptake. I guess the other thing is, too, if you don't release that water, phosphorus is not going anywhere either. Right. So again, if you can if you can um, store that water and then perhaps use it or just let it uh, soak back into the ground, you might be way better off as well. So again, that, that might be the other thing to consider as well. Interesting. You can come research at our district in southeastern Manitoba. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. Um, any any ask, last comments before? Oh, right up there in the top corner. An old timer that has a quarter section of class one land with eight acres of oak bush on it that's been there for upwards of 200 years, I suppose, it would make lumber. If I sold that quarter section to my neighbor, he'll disappear. What's the loss to our environment or, or, or to the, the farm itself once those trees are gone? That, that's a great question. And again, if we, if we take like a, an aerial view of our province, right, we don't have much of this wild land left. And so these are our refuges for a lot of plants and animals, right? And so I, I do have concerns about losing the little bits we have left. I, I personally would, would advocate very strongly to kind of help protect what we have left and potentially even expand what we got. But again, there are, you know, again, there's economics to deal with, right? If we do want to expand our riparian areas, that might mean putting land out of production. Well, who's going to pay for that, right? So again, we need programs and incentives to kind of help producers and people maintain and keep what we got. I also really like, there was, uh, again, earlier today, there was someone who was talking about the, they put their lower, low lying areas into perennial grasses and forage. I thought that was a fantastic idea. Like you're making good use of that low lying area, right? It's not put out of production. You changed what's being, being produced. But you, you raise, I think, a really um, great and question in terms of, well, what do we lose? Thank you.
Thanks, Alex. The project Alex was referring to was the Harold Jansen S. St. Rat Rosa Watershed District Perennial Grass Project. <laughs> <laughs> you can find it on our website <laughs> or stop by our booth later on. <laughs> um, any, any last comments that we had today? Alex, do you have a booth or do you have a way that people can talk to you around while you're here t today and tomorrow? Um, I do have a website. And you'll be in the sessions? Yeah, I'll, I'll be hanging around for the rest of the day. Okay. And I'll be here tomorrow at the banquet. Okay, so the rest of the day today, tomorrow at the banquet, feel free to come find Alex.